I think one of the big takeaways was just the joy of being with Christians. So as much as we loved the objects and as much as they really do tell a story, there's something so inspiring about meeting believers all over the world and seeing that wherever people went, they took the gospel with them, and now there are people there. Because ultimately, we're not about objects, we're about souls. And so in some way, all those objects somehow point toward the people that the Lord has drawn to himself from one end of the earth to the other. It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is the one and only Tim Challies, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Epic, An Around the World Journey Through Christian History. Tim, my friend, this is long overdue. Welcome to the show. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Well, Tim, I know, even though I've been following you for many, many years, I know you're still going to be new to some of our listeners. So let's kick off our conversation with a bit of the Tim Challies origin story. For the listeners encountering you for the first time in our talk today, what are a few things they need to know about you? Probably not very much they need to know about me, but they could know. I'm an author and blogger. I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm married to Aileen and have been for 22 years or so. And we've got three kids who are 13. 17 and 20. How's that? That's perfect. I like it. And in terms of you, like I've watched you kind of go through some different identity shifts in the Christian publishing space. I mean, you really were known as sort of the premier blogger in the Christian space for many years. And then you have become this author of many books. Uh, I believe you're a pastor. So I'd love to hear a little bit about for you, if you look back across the journey from when you started out as a blogger to now, like what are some of the identity shifts you've walked through, so to speak? Yeah, when I started blogging, I was a church member, I was in the computer field, and blogging was just sort of something I was doing for fun, for my family mostly. My parents and brother and sisters live in the state, so I was writing for their benefit, just interesting topics or topics that were interesting to us, hence Chalice.com was meant to be a family site. Over time, other people started reading it, and it just kind of grew into being its own thing. Just around the time, I started thinking, you know, I could actually do this as a job. I could do this kind of full-time. My church asked me to be a pastor, so I was on staff there for a number of years, probably about five years, and then more recently kind of rotated off. So I'm still an elder at my church, no longer on staff, and uh, the blogging is what I do full-time now. And I write the occasional book, but if I define myself by one vocation, that would be it. I'm a blogger primarily. Next, let's get into the story behind this brand new book. I'd love to hear a bit about how you, say, caught the vision for this project and why it was so important for you to experience the historical objects that you profile in the book up close and in person. I feel like that's a unique aspect of the journey with this book. Yeah, I think it was. So I've always had a love of history and an interest in church history, and really a lot of it was wanting to better understand church history as it pertains to me. Really, I'm a Christian, and I think it's important for me to know and others to know that when you become a Christian, you're entering into something. There's this long history there. 2,000 years of people to look back on and learn from. When you join a family, the family's history becomes your history. And I wanted to embrace that in my own life. And so quite a number of years ago, I started looking for objects, historical objects. I sort of had this interest in finding things that still exist that can be a link to the past. You can see it, you can touch it at times, and that would just sort of show you this link to the past. And so I did some research on it. But at the end, just kind of felt like it was empty without actually seeing them, without actually experiencing them. So it was one thing to look or to find an object in a book. It was another thing to actually go and encounter that object. And so I had this real desire to go out and find these things. And I was enabled to actually do that. So I was able to travel the world, went to 24 countries, I believe, and scoured museums and cathedrals and churches and all sorts of things, and actually dug up some of these objects that really are a neat link between today and history, Christian history. And as often happens when new books arrive at my house, my wife gets a hold of them before they even make their way up to my office. And one of the things she noted when she opened up our copy of Epic was she's like, wow, this would be a fantastic resource for homeschooling. And I'm curious from your perspective as the author, as you were working on this project, who is the core audience that you had in mind? And what are some of the different places you'd like to see the book and DVD put to use? It might sound a little arrogant, but I think almost every author writes for themselves first in the sense that I wouldn't want to write a book that I myself would not want to read. 
So if somebody else had written this book, I would read it and enjoy it. So I think the primary thing was if I enjoy it, then hopefully others do. I'm a pretty normal person, just kind of average, relatable person. So if I enjoy it, then hopefully others will as well. Subsequent to that, I think what I really hoped is that people who don't have much of an interest in history, people who have maybe been introduced to church history but found it dry, found it boring, would be able to dive into this and be able to see these objects, see lots of photos from around the world. It's written pretty casually. I'm hoping it'll draw in people who, this will be an introduction to church history. And even if this is all they get, they'll still have some grounding, but maybe it'll point them deeper as well and cause them to maybe latch onto a historical figure or two or a historical time period and just ground themselves more and more in the historic Christian faith in that way. I do think homeschoolers will enjoy it and find it useful, but I think it should, I hope, hit a quite a wide audience. I think one of the things that's really brilliant about this resource is people do tend to have shorter attention spans, and so being able to introduce them to bite-sized pieces of church history through objects That seems very uh, easy to handle. You're not going to overwhelm them, so to speak, out of the gate. And so for this next part of the interview, would love to help the listeners get a sense of kind of what they're going to encounter as they work their way through the book. And so I picked a few of what I thought were some rather unique historical object choices. So talk to us about the indulgence box that you put on display in the book. You know, I think for people who are familiar with Martin Luther's story, they've got some level of familiarity. And if they're familiar with that part of church history, they're going to know what that is. But I'm betting there's some listeners right now who have no idea what an indulgence box even is. So talk to us about that and why it's important for church history. A few years ago, 2017, we went past the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and I know a lot of people then were researching Martin Luther and reading a lot about him. And one thing they might recognize is indulgences. And an indulgence box was the box that was taken around from town to town so people could put their money in the box. It was a lock box, essentially. People would put their money in that box in exchange for an indulgence. An indulgence was a way of essentially purchasing forgiveness, the church's way of dispensing forgiveness for those who'd be willing to pay for it. Ultimately, of course, it was used to fund building projects and other things. But It was this, the purchase of indulgences, that really inflamed Luther to write his 95 Theses, and from there to spark the Reformation. So you know he didn't mean to start a Protestant movement, he just wanted the Church to clean itself up. But along the way, of course, there was a complete break between Protestants and Catholics. So in its own way, a box like that, we don't know if Luther ever saw this box, but he certainly would have seen something like it. And so you can look at this box sitting in a museum, And it tells the story of the Protestant Reformation, the beginnings of that great schism between Protestants and Catholics that recovered the true gospel. Yeah, I think my favorite quote related to the indulgence boxes comes from, was it Johann Tetzel, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from Purgatory Springs. Exactly. (laughs) So it's an English translation of something he was actually (laughs) saying, make it a handy little rhyme. And people were actually doing that. And the amazing thing is, if you go to Rome today, you can still do that. There's still many places you can go to Rome where you could make some sort of transaction or just do something, and you can still receive an indulgence. The Pope regularly administers indulgences out to the faithful. So even though a lot has changed since the time of the Reformation, that whole system of indulgence still exists, the Church dispensing forgiveness or uh, remitting the consequences of sin. It still goes on. Tim, next I'd love for you to tell us about the important of John Bunyan's jug. What can we learn from that? So that's an interesting little object in a museum dedicated to John Bunyan. John Bunyan was, of course, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, and at one point he was put in prison for being Baptist, essentially, for not conforming to the church there. And while he was in prison, his daughter would bring him food, and this little jug was what she used to bring him food day by day. And so The Pilgrim's Progress, being the most widely read and most translated book outside of the Bible, we have a little link to it from this little jug and how it sustained him while he was in prison writing his book. Another one that I thought was kind of an interesting choice was Andrew Fuller's Snuffbox. What do we get to learn from that? That is an interesting one. And when I started this project, Andrew Fuller's Snuffbox was this thing I'd heard of, this object I had heard of. It's a weird one. It's a quirky one. 
but it has a strange significance. So, of course, a snuff box is a box that was used to carry snuff, tobacco. Before people smoked it, they would snuff it up their nostrils. And Andrew Fuller was one of those people who enjoyed the snuff. And he was a friend of William Carey, of course, who sparked a great worldwide missionary movement. And he and Carey had decided they ought to form this mission society with some other friends. They gathered together, they formed the society, and right away they wanted to take up a collection to put the first bit of money toward the uh, evangelism of the world. So they didn't know what to take this collection up in, and so Fuller pulled out a snuff box, tipped out whatever was in there, and he passed the box around and everybody put their money in it. I knew the story, but I had been told the snuff box had been lost to history. But I was actually in an archive, and the archivist there who cares for this whole collection of carry material She heard me talking about it and said, I know where you can find that. And so we took off and drove for a while, found this little museum dedicated to Andrew Fuller. And sure enough, there it was. So it was a neat little find. And in terms of your journey, you personally, were there any particular objects that you got to view that were most impactful for you, most meaningful for you? I'm curious, of all the objects, which was most memorable or stood out for you? I think Amy Carmichael's Bible was special. For two reasons. First, we found her Bible in archives in Northern Ireland. She was from Northern Ireland, and it was one of the first trips we made, one of the first objects I found. And there's just something about holding that Bible. She had written in it extensively, she had color coded it, she had a whole system, and you could just see she had dedicated her life to reading this Bible. And so that was really special. But then after we found that, we actually went to the south of India where she served for so many years and found this huge ministry she had started there, this massive property, all these buildings. She had wanted to care for orphans, had wanted to start a hospital, and all that was still in existence. But maybe one of the most special moments was meeting this elderly woman there who had actually been received to the orphanage by Amy Carmichael. She had held her, she had prayed for her, she had given her her name. And now here is this woman, May Maller, all these years later, serving in this ministry. So it was a really neat link between past and present. There was an object, but in this case, there was also a person. Yeah, I find it's always amazing when we can actually get face-to-face with a person who actually met or touched somebody who was a core part of church history. Uh, About a year, year and a half ago, I got to talk to somebody who was Corey Tenboom's assistant in the latter years before Corey passed away. And so getting one step closer to somebody who spent time with some of these iconic figures from church history is always a treat and a pleasure. I'm curious, Tim, in terms of the globetrotting journey that you went on, you know, this is a massive undertaking. As you look back across all the different experiences you had, anything that stands out or was particularly memorable, good, bad, or in between, I'm sure you had some adventures. Yeah, we did have some adventures. You know, considering how much we traveled and how far we went, We did so, so well. We never got sick. We never had terrible misconnections in our flights or anything like that. So we just really felt the Lord's kindness in that. I think one of the big takeaways was just the joy of being with Christians. So as much as we loved the objects and as much as they really do tell a story, there was something so inspiring about meeting believers all over the world and seeing that wherever people went, they took the gospel with them, and now there are people there. Because ultimately, we're not about objects, we're about souls. And so in some way, all those objects somehow point toward the people that the Lord has drawn to himself from one end of the earth to the other. That was really part of the joy of it, finding objects, but also finding believers, brothers and sisters, and just seeing how similar we are to one another, very different cultures, very different backgrounds, very different circumstances, yet pursuing the same Savior. Tim, when you think of a reader getting to that last page of Epic, how do you hope you've impacted their understanding of church history? I hope they understand they're part of church history, that as they've come into the family of God, they become a part of something. So there's this historical arrogance we can all feel, like we need to start over in every generation. Nobody's ever gone through anything like this before. Nobody's ever seen anything like this before. But I think through church history, we learn that our forebears have gone through many of the same things we have, that maybe today's theological issues are best dealt with by looking to the past, looking back in time and seeing how other Christians dealt with this, or even some of the current events as we deal with the time of plague, we can look back and see how have Christians done with this in the past? How have they handled these things? What have they learned through it? What can we learn from them? So I think anchoring ourselves, I want our first instinct to be when something comes along, obviously we want to think, what does Scripture say? But we want to think, 
what does our tradition say? What does Christianity say? What do these 2,000 years of brothers and sisters, how can they inform us before thinking we need to solve this on our own as if nobody's ever thought of this before? And we mentioned it briefly earlier, but I want to make sure we come back to it. There is a companion DVD that's correlated to the book. I think it'd be helpful before we wrap up, Tim, if you could just tell us a little bit about why that's a value add. How is that going to enhance the experience of working through Epic? Sure. So the book is primarily words. The film, of course, is primarily images. So you get to uh, see both sides of it. The DVD shows a lot more of the search. The object focuses on what we found. So through the DVD, you'll see me actually interacting with people, walking through museums, driving through different contexts. You get to see the world through the lens of the camera. And then you'll see some of the objects, but the book really focuses in more on the story of the object. And so that's how I distinguish it. The DVD shows the search. The book shows the actual finds. And Tim, for the listeners who would like to connect with you, find out more about the book, where are some of the places we can see you on the web? The best place is at challies.com. I write there every day. There's something new every day. And sometimes it's something I've written. Sometimes it's pointing toward things others have written. But you'll find something there every day that I hope, I trust, you'll find valuable. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes places where you can connect with Tim and pick up your own copy of this brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabot Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Tim Challies. Once again, our book today was epic and around the world journey through Christian history. To connect with Tim and find out more, as he said, a great place to start is his website. You can access that over at challies.com. And Tim, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to finally have you on the show. Thank you very much.